now. Um, for folks who aren't super familiar with Zoom, just so you know, um, you won't be recorded unless you speak because we're going to record the speaker view as opposed to the gallery view. So um, I'm so glad to see that so many of our prospective law students are on camera. I'm really grateful for for you bringing your faces and bringing your presence into our meeting. There's nothing worse than teaching or speaking into a whole bunch of black little screens. Um, so I really appreciate you um, being here with us. Um, so yeah, if you have a question but you don't wanna be recorded, then you're welcome to put that question in the chat when it comes time. And uh, one of my colleagues, probably Robin from Lakehead is going to read some of those questions if folks don't want um, to read them themselves. So um, let me uh, go back to my notes here. Um, so I wanted to let you know about that. In terms of our agenda today, so our formal program is going to close at 1.30 or maybe a few minutes after because we did get started a little bit late, not surprisingly. For folks who are still here at 1.30, you're going to be entered into a draw to win some law school swag from all of the Ontario law schools. So you will get eight parcels in the mail. We're gonna have four winners who are gonna get eight parcels in the mail and um, from each of the law schools, which I'm sure inevitably will include a lot of mugs. Um, but I know that Western has some like cozy socks that they're gonna send for students. So you're gonna get some fun mail. Um, so if someone sends you an email asking you for your address, that means that you are a winner. Um, not everyone needs to stay, but um, we kind of received two headings of questions when we when we asked folks to submit questions ahead of time. We had a whole bunch of questions which we thought were a good use of our panelists expertise, which are um, pertaining to their experience of law school, their experience being a lawyer, and that's what we're going to spend the first hour-ish of the presentation talking about. And then after we, you've had a chance to meet all of the law school representatives, then we're going to spend the last half an hour between 1.30 and 2 for those who are interested in staying, talking about more technical admissions type questions. Um, if you are interested in that information, but you are not able to stay until 2 o'clock because you have other commitments, all of it's going to be recorded. So you can access the video, um, you can send me an email, I'm going to put it on the YouTube channel that I run for my law school, but I think each of the law schools is going to find a different place to put the video. Um, so don't worry if you can't stay the whole time. Um, so with that, I think that's all I have in terms of opening um, housekeeping type things. I'm going to turn to our panelists. You've been provided biographies for these panelists. So instead of my spending time reading all of them, um, the first question that I'm going to pose to all of our panelists is their self introduction. So um, they're going to talk a little bit about themselves and then we're going to move on to your prepared questions. And I can't say thank you enough to everyone who um, submitted questions ahead of time. I was so pleasantly surprised by um, not only the quantity of questions, but the quality of questions as well. We have a whole bunch of really great um, questions to ask our panelists. So uh, with that, I'm scrolling down and um, I'm going to start by asking uh, Jeff to introduce himself. So we have four panelists, Jeff, Sherry, Etienne, and Who am I missing? I'm awful, Jamie. And um, and they are going to do their self introduction. So Jeff, would you go first, please? Sure, why not? Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, my name's Jeff Warnock. Uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a citizen of the, the Métis Nation of Ontario uh, from the Georgian Bay community uh, with, with ties as well to, to other communities as well within the Upper Great Lakes. Um, but uh, I, I'm just really thrilled to be here. I gotta be honest, as, as somebody who uh, you know, graduated about 10 years ago now. It's it's so fantastic to see so many students uh, wanting to learn more about applying to law school. And I'm hoping what I can maybe offer to you today is a little bit of a discussion around my path, which has included some work in private practice, some work um, uh, for the Métis Nation of Ontario on, on things like rights assertion issues, and maybe talk a little bit about what I'm doing now, which is in uh, a teaching role as well. Um, yeah, so I'm just, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Jamie, would you go next? 
Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Lickers. I'm Haudenosaunee. I'm from the Six Nations community here in Southern Ontario. Um, I spent uh, most of my legal career until very recently practicing at two national law firms in the area of Indigenous law primarily. Um, and at the end of my private law practice, I was managing the Indigenous practice group for Gowlings nationally. And I just recently left uh, private practice and took a role with uh, CIBC as their vice president of Indigenous markets. And I started that in October. So I'm now a non-practicing lawyer and, and a banker. So I can answer any questions you might have about either industry. And I'm really glad to be here with you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, Etienne, would you go next? Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here uh, talking to you as well. When I uh, was going to law school, we never had Zoom or these technologies to get us all together. So this is really convenient and, and great. Thanks for organizing it. I'm a member of the Binjawab Exagi Nishnabek, which is uh, close to Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, I don't like to just limit myself to that community. My family's from the Lake Nipigon region. I have family all around Lake Nipigon, and I, I acknowledge that there's at least one other person, a student here today, who's from the Lake Nipigon region. So so I'm happy to see that you're here. I've been a lawyer since 2005. I was called to the bar in 2005. I graduated from Osgoode Hall Law School. And back then I chose Osgoode Hall because of um, the great Aboriginal law curriculum and teachers they had at that time. But that was, I always wanted to do Aboriginal law. I grew up listening to my grandparents and their siblings and my aunts and uncles and everyone talking about political issues, treaty right issues. and I, it was just kind of something that was it's always been around my uh, around me so that's why I decided to go into that field it's something I've been passionate about so to get there I went and took a BA in political science from the University of Windsor and I only did a BA just because I knew I wanted to be a lawyer so I don't want to do an HBA it just that was just another year from me getting to my goal so I, I, I did the three-year BA and then I got in and um I took uh, some law related courses when I was doing my uh, undergraduate because I was in political science. If you look at any of your schools, they'll have political science courses. There'll be some law related courses. Um, you know, I found those helpful because it helped me to start thinking about principles of law and which became helpful when I got to law school. Uh, now I am, I, I work for myself. I'm, I'm a self-employed solo practitioner. I started off in a regional firm uh, and I worked there for eight years and got some good experience. And then in 2012, um, I just decided to do my own thing. I've always had a had a desire to be my own boss, to be a business owner. Uh, it's part of the reason also why I went to law, because you can certainly uh, learn about business and go into business fields. Like you've heard from Jamie, she's gone into a different business field involving banking. So, you know, the law profession gives you those opportunities to go in all sorts of different directions. So now I'm a truly sold. What I'm doing and there's nothing... Uh, wrong with being solo at all. Uh, there's a big need for, uh, especially in the smaller communities for lawyers to set up and, and, and provide services. And uh, one professional um, achievement that I received, uh, which I'm pretty proud of and happy for is uh, I was, in 2019, I put my name out to become a, a bencher. And I was elected to be a bencher for the Northwest region in, in, uh, of the, to the Law Society of Ontario, which was a, a big accomplishment for me because I had to you know, get political and actually put my name out there and run against people and I pulled it off. So, and, and I got to know before that through my work at the Indigenous Advisory Group, I got to know Danielle who's here and Constance. I've met a lot of friends along the way. So it's very nice to be speaking to you with my friends here today. Thank you. Marcy, thank you so much, Etienne. And for those who don't know, the Law Society of Ontario is the regulator. So they're, they're in charge of making sure when lawyers make mistakes that we get in trouble and deciding who gets to, and they don't do the best job of that, but they're working on it. And, um, and they also decide to, to um, who gets to practice law in Ontario. And the benchers are like the board members, the elected board members of the Law Society. So we're really grateful that ATN as an Indigenous person is representing the interests of Indigenous lawyers in the province. So. Um, thank you for mentioning that. And last but not least, uh, our panelist Nimki Quay or Sherry is going to introduce herself. 
Nimkikwa Indijnikos, Ondagamni Kaning, First Nation, Indunuba. My name is Sherry. Um, I'm from Ondagamni uh, Kaning, First Nation on Manitoulin Island. That's where I grew up. Um, I do live in Thunder Bay. That's where I work. Um, so in my undergrad, before I got to law school, I did the Native Human Services Program at uh, Laurentian, uh, yes, Laurentian, I keep confusing with Lakehead, with Laurentian University. Um, it was a four-year program, honors. Um, I uh, actually had a very troubled childhood. Uh, um, and so I had initially never thought that I'd even go to any post-secondary, right? So I went to college, did okay there. So I tried university, didn't know how well that was gonna go. I had an A average and I did very well. So, you know, I was, I was surprised, <laughs> but, you know, I, I did well in university and then um, a friend of mine suggested that we try to go to law school. And so I'm very impulsive. So I said, yeah, let's go to law school, not thinking I'd ever get in. So, you know, I hate to say I, it was not a planned thing for me, uh, but, uh, you know, apparently I heard that over a thousand people applied and 60 people got in. So my understanding would be like 6% or something get in. So I didn't think I was going to get in. And then I got in. So when I got in, it's not like I could say no, right? You're like you got into law school, you're not gonna, so I, that's how I ended up in law school. So I, I, I can give advice as far as that, or, or you know, but um, uh, I just wanted to kind of put that out there because it wasn't really something I'd planned on. So as far as uh, telling anybody about what sort of undergrad to do, I would just suggest perhaps doing something that you're very interested in, that you would do, um, do well in, right? Because you need the marks, you need good marks to be able to get into any of the law schools. And when you get there, perhaps you don't have any sort of law background. Like I, I didn't, I, I did social work, human, native human services. And um, it was just a little bit harder for me in the first year because I didn't have that background, right? So that's the only thing I would suggest is if you want to have a little bit of a more background when you get there, take, takes a little, at least something in law, right? Some sort of background, but so I did struggle a little bit more than my peers for that reason, but you, you pick it up by, by, you know, halfway through second year, you, you pretty much caught up to everybody else anyway. Um, so I just want to mention that I work as a criminal defense lawyer uh, today. I've uh, graduated and got called to the bar in uh, 29, June, 2019 which, you know, I practiced for, I'd say about a good six, seven, eight months before the pandemic. And then it's just been, you know, uh, really hasn't been a whole lot going on since then. So I don't have a whole lot of experience as yet, but I do have some experience and, you know, I'm happy to be here today and uh, nice to meet everybody. Miigwech. Miigwech, thank you so much. So Adrian, I see your question in the chat. That's awesome. We're gonna keep an eye on it, but we're gonna go through our prepared list of questions that we think are going to be um, of most use to the broadest swath of the audience. And then we'll go into questions if we have time towards the end. So thank you all so much for your self introductions. My first question is for Jamie. And it is, Jamie, what was your experience in taking the LSAT? Um, insofar as you can remember, can you tell us a bit about how you felt when you were applying for law school? Did you find it to be a stressful process? Um, and, you know, hopefully we're not re-traumatizing you and asking you this <laughs> or asking you to think too well, far back. I don't know that this is going to make any of the students feel better, but the LSAT process was a lot less stressful than the bar exam. So if you're going to get on this path, um, I hate to break it to you. There, there are a lot of stressful moments that will follow your decision. Um, you know, I, it's funny, I always wanted to be a lawyer and no one in my family really knows where that conviction came from because there are no lawyers in our family. I didn't grow up knowing any lawyers. I must have seen a television show or something late at night sneaking into my parents' room when I wasn't supposed to. And there must have been some lawyer on a show that I thought was cool or looked like they had a nice life or a nice car or something. But um, as a result, it, unlike Sherry, who has a completely different story, um, I am not impulsive. I'm the opposite of impulsive. I'm a planner. My ex-husband once told me that I could plan the fun out of anything, which is why he's now my ex-husband. Um, but all that to say, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And so I did everything that I could to make that a reality for myself. 
Um, I took an LSAT prep course. I asked a lot of people who were in law school how, how they did well on the LSAT. Um, I got my hands on every single practice LSAT that I could. And after taking the prep course, I, I did um, practice test after practice test under exam conditions. So timed um, the way that it would be during the LSAT. Um, and that was my approach. And I probably even had some Excel spreadsheet or something with like a chart of timelines and how many tests I wanted to complete a week and God knows what else, because I am a planner, as I've mentioned. So, um, but that it worked for me. Um, and I also find, you know, I'm the kind of person that if I have a plan and I'm following my plan, that is how I remove stress from my own life. Um, some people find being subjected to like rigid rules and plans and timelines might actually be more stressful for them. But for me, it lessens my stress. So that worked for me. And obviously, obviously the results paid off because I did well enough on the LSAT to get into law school and, uh, and the rest is history. Uh, Nyawe, thank you so much, Jamie. So I I know that some some of the um, questions ahead of time were about the actual scores that you need to get into law school, and we're going to deal with that after we close the event at 1.30 in the last half an hour talking about law school admissions, because it varies greatly from school to school. Um, but thank you, Jamie, for sharing that with us. My next question, and I'm going to try to move fast. I think we could spend 45 minutes talking about any one of these questions, but we're going to try to um, cover as much as we can in our short amount of time together. So Sherry, I'm curious to know how you survived law school. What were the biggest struggles you faced while you attended law school? And do you have any reg regrets? Well, I'm not sure I survived law school. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know how, what to say about that particular question. I found it was very difficult because I came from such a, a holistic view of healing, love, respect, the seven grandfather teaching. So it was really hard for me to put that aside because it was just how I grew up. Like it wasn't even something that I thought of until I got to law school. And then law school is about like, you know, you put all those emotions aside, it's just the law. So I also had a lot of pushback uh, while I was in school from um, colonial settlers, they didn't like um, a lot of the indigenous law. Um, I feel like sometimes maybe it was the fact that they felt like we were getting something they weren't. So I was ostracized at times whenever I tried to push back on any of that stuff. So after first year, I just stopped saying anything um, about that as well. Um, so that was sort of difficult. At the time, our law school was just starting out. We were the third cohort um, at the Bora Alaskan Faculty of Law. So we didn't really have um, social worker or like any um, guidance or, or any or assistance from anybody at that time. But uh, I did start the, uh, did assist with the, um, we have uh, ILSA, the Indigenous Law Students Association at our school. So I did um, assist in getting a room so that we could have our own space, right? Our own indigenized space there and I believe we still have it. We started out with a very small room on the main floor. I don't know if Robin Sutherland knows, but it was actually his office. It was just a little little areas with the size of a bedroom maybe, maybe a little bigger. Um, and then we went from there. I uh, did a, a plan to uh, the actual to the university and then they uh, allowed us a bigger space and they actually let us pick a bigger space up on the top floor, which we picked. So there is a nice space there now. Um, and that was really what helped me. I would go there just to clear my mind and be alone. And so that was really great. And then um, I started a mentorship program as well because I realized that I didn't have any supports. So I wanted to make sure that other students who came, especially indigenous students who came, had supports as well. So we started the indigenous um, mentorship program. So what we had done is had like some of the lawyers that I'd known, upper law students, indigenous law students mentor some of the younger ones, right? I'm still in touch with some of my mentees as well, still assisting them. Um, one of them I'm very proud to say is uh, articling with the SCJ and my uh, other um, mentee is will be articling with the SCJ next year. So I like to think I'm part of that, but I'm probably not. <laughs> I very proudly say that. Um, so uh, as far as uh, applying to law school, um, I, had, I think I just kind of went through that, what happened there. And uh, I, I'd only picked Bora Alaskan Faculty of Law. That's the only school I wanted to go to. Um, it had the um, Indigenous component and, and that's really all I wanted to do at that point, right? 
and so I, I did find it to be a very stressful process for sure, I guess, the LSAT and um, um, I would definitely uh, reinforce the things that Jamie had stated about the LSAT to make sure you prepare. Um, I, I would definitely recommend taking a course. You know, it's all up to each person, I realize too, like what your style is and what you need as well, right? For me, I really kind of needed somebody else sort of to explain things to me a little bit more. So that's where I would go with that. Um, so as far as having any regrets, I don't, I don't have any regrets, that's for sure. I mean, I'm a lawyer now and I feel like I can help as many people as possible, especially Indigenous people and also marginalized, racialized people who are, I believe, victimized by our uh, criminal justice system, by the justice system period. And so it breaks my heart that that's the process. And I mean, there are a lot of times maybe I used to cry maybe once a week, just trying to get through it. Um, because it is so difficult to realize that we criminalize a lot of a lot of indigenous people and we and criminalize marginalized people and stuff like that. So, you know, I don't have any I don't have any regrets for those reasons because I'm able to help people that I, that I want to help. Miigwech. Thank you so much, uh, Sherry. Thank you for sharing, especially the importance of community, both having the community within the law school and then looking to the indigenous lawyers and the folks who've come before you. I have also personally found that a huge source of strength. And when our panelists got together to meet, you know, we spent the first kind of 20 minutes talking about all the people we know in common, because it really is a small world. And that's an important thing to point out. So I appreciate that. Our next question is for Etienne. Um, what resources did you use in law school and how did you manage stress and the heavy course load? What support services for Indigenous students are typically available in Canadian law schools? And I guess you can speak specifically to your um, experience at Osgood, please. Sure. This is a, a very good question and, it's, and there, there's a lot to answer here. Um, I'm gonna give you just some high level points to think about, but uh, University of, well, York University and Osgood, they had, um, you know, quite a few resources available. Um, but before I even got to the law school, I was talking to you about this before we had our call here today, but back then we had a program called the Program of Legal Studies for Native Peoples. It was called the Saskatchewan Summer Program. And I attended that program. It dealt with uh, property law. And when I completed that course over the summer, I, I got my, uh, I got a credit in property law, so I didn't have to take real estate law in 101 when I got to law school, which was, which was a benefit of the program. But it also just helped me before I got to law school create some important networks and friendships, which I still have today. And and some of my closest friends. Uh, well, my, my best friends are actually from that program. We keep in touch, and even though we're, we're right across the country. And, and I found that to be a very useful resource and program to, that helped me get uh, ready for what was ahead of me. And if you have an opportunity to attend a program like that, I suggest you consider doing so. When I got to the law school itself, uh, Osgood uh, had a lot of resources available in terms of trying to offer supports, you know, no, I don't think any school could do it perfectly or the best, but you know, there was there was effort there, which was nice. And they did listen to the students and, and things that we thought would be useful. Like, so exam, an example is we had uh, elders come into the school often, which was nice because you could just uh, take a break from the studies and the busy course load and, and have our lunch and have a break. Always had that person available to talk to that's important to know that's available. Osgood had that specifically, so I didn't have to go outside Osgood, but I'm sure uh, York University also would probably have that available to uh, students, just like any other university probably would as well. Um, we also, Osgood arranged for a tutor to come in and help with the Indigenous students if we wanted. Uh, you know, they didn't tell us you had to, it was, just, it was available, and, and I took advantage of that because I was always trying to improve uh, my uh, skills of writing and, and understanding the uh, legal principles sometimes it gets confusing so it's often nice to have that uh, person who's uh, it's usually I'm, I'm a graduate student who comes in who's, who's already been through so that person's already been through, been through the process of getting her um, back then as a bachelor's of law and they help you work through the problems um, I spent a lot of time at the library and the reason why I did that is because there's a lot of distractions at home even though I was living by myself and in law school, it's, it's easy to get distracted at home and, and don't focus on what you need to. So for me, I, 
I treated going to law school like a, my full-time job and I got up every day and, and I had a routine and you know and I would go and work at the school and in Toronto because of traffic jams and all that I never left the school till after 7 p.m back in the day I don't know how, how late it's gotten now but you know it, just, it became a routine and, and I always just you know tried to chip away at the pile of work that was uh, thrown at us because there is a lot of work there's a lot of reading and you need to work at it it's, it's not going to be a light course so it doesn't matter what school you go to it's going to be busy uh, we have back then we had computer labs on campus i have no idea how that's done now but you know those are often useful resources uh, people would be around there as well uh, at osgood we also had an indigenous law students office within the school itself uh, i can't speak to whether or not that's still there or not but that was a nice place to meet and hang out sometimes with, with some of your friends from, uh, from school. And there's also just a resource of each other. And, and I want to just emphasize this because I didn't really appreciate this so much in first year as, as opposed to the second, third, and second and third year. And that's just the importance of um, reaching out to others in your class. Some of these people, you, you know, you may not have anything in common with them from where you come from or any of that, but when you start talking a lot, it's, it's quite interesting how you have that in common. And uh, I've, I've became friends with a few people in law school and we haven't really kept in touch afterwards, but at the time we were in study groups together and, and we helped each other out. We talked about the problems, we worked on preparing for the exams and, and talking about the legal principles. And, and that's very important because law can be very, uh, it's very easy to just go bury your face in the books write your papers and just not come out. And you, you, that's very, it's dangerous to do that. It's important to, to come out and, and try to facilitate and, and take advantage of those opportunities to network and, and help, uh, which will help you learn at the end of the day. And then I also looked at the broader community resources and that's any, any city you go to should take a look and see what's available for you in the broader community. Uh, so for example, there is, um, at this, and like I mentioned, at the, at the campus itself, there's other programs available for Indigenous uh, students and there's often associations and resources. Toronto itself has the Friendship Centre and there's all sorts of program programming through there. And, you know, Toronto had all sorts of other Indigenous events that you can attend throughout the year, which was nice. And then it's also just important, I think, to just think about mental health resources. And just like, just keep in mind that, you know, it's going to be challenging, but you need to find some balance wherever you can to, to do other things. And for me, um, you know, the, I, I took advantage of some of the intramural sports that were available through uh, the law school. So basically the law school would be su submitting teams and you get to know some of your classmates like that. Um, York has got pretty good fitness facilities on campus, which is nice to go take a break and go work out. And one, one thing that I just remember is like after first year, I realized how warm it was in Toronto. And I'm a very, well, I was more of an outdoorsy person back then in terms of, you know, camping and stuff like that. So in the fall time, in second and third year, I brought my camping gear down. I just brought my tent and, and I went camping. I went up to Georgian Bay. It was only like two hour ride from, from the law school and found a spot at one of the nice beaches. And that was part of my fall routine. I'd go up there and enjoy the camping while it was cold up north down there. It was certainly warm. So those are just some thoughts and suggestions I have for you to think about. Thank you. Marcy, thank you so much, Etienne. So um, for those who don't know, one of my nicknames is Demanda. And I am now going to put my Demanda hat on and ask our panelists, challenge our panelists to answer all of the questions in two minutes or less. And this is something that lawyers get used to because when they go to appeal court, they get very strict limitations on the time that they have to speak to the court. So in the spirit of practicing your oral advocacy skills, Jeff, I am going to ask you the next question, which you have a two minute limit on. Um, and that is, what is the process of becoming a lawyer in Ontario? Can you tell us a little bit about what articling is? And can you end by telling us if everyone who goes to law school necessarily has to become a lawyer? That's like four questions, Demanda, and you're giving him two minutes. I, got I don't know seconds, if that's either. fair. Well, Demanda, is, you're giving me. Is, there's of... no fair. There's no fairness review here. Oh, it's fine. You're giving me flashes back to uh, being in front of a motions judge who very clearly wants me to get my point out and and move on. Um, so I'll try to be as as succinct as I can. I, I put together a few notes just thinking about these types of issues. Um, 
In terms of what the process is like to become a lawyer, um, it's relatively uh, straightforward. It's a time it's a time consuming process. It takes a lot of work, but it's it's relatively straightforward. Um, the typical experience, um, I mean, and experiences vary, but you'll you know you'll typically complete whatever it is that you're going to be doing for your degree program. Maybe you'll even do several degrees before you think about going to law school. Um, you'll go and do your your three year law school program at any of the any of the the Canadian law schools. Um, you'll write the bar exam, uh, which is a series of, of, at least in the Ontario context, it's a series of two exams, each or, they're each a day long. Um, and then after you've completed your bar exams, or sometimes before, you'll do what's called the articling or law practice program. So what does that mean? Um, the Law Society of Ontario is actually a really great resource if you're interested in the Ontario context, has a really well laid out step-by-step -step, how do you become a lawyer chart that kind of lays out these, these steps in detail. but um, generally speaking, you will, uh, at the end of your law school career, complete what's called an articling placement. It's a 10 month work placement, basically, where you're going to work uh, either in a firm or maybe you'll work in government. Wherever you're working, you're working under the supervision of practicing and licensed uh, lawyers, and you'll work under their supervision. They'll delegate work to you. They'll supervise your work in a workplace, uh, a work placement for 10 months. Um, upon the completion of that, then you'll get called to the bar, you get your own license, and you're then free to practice law. Um, the alternative, and this is relatively new, recent, is the, the LLP program, um, which is a sort of replicates the articling experience, but you don't need to do that with a set employer. They're run through the university. So the, um, I believe there's one run through the University of Ottawa uh, in French. But I could be corrected on that, but I know that the English one at least is run through Ryerson, um, so you can do that as well. Um, and then in the last question, I'll try to be as quick as I can. In terms of whether everybody who goes to law school either you know needs or wants to become a lawyer, the answer is no. Um, I would say the majority certainly who go to law school plan to at least um, complete their degree, get called to the bar, they get their license. That's the typical experience. But once you've gotten to that stage, um, career paths vary greatly. Um, some will go into private practice, some might go work for government, but others might start their own business. Um, I have colleagues of mine who never practiced law. They got their law degree, got called to the bar, got their license, immediately started their own business. Um, others will go into public policy. Others might then pursue an academic career. They might do their PhD. Um, so there's no one path. Um, you, can, you can do a lot with a law degree. That's one of the great advantages of doing a law degree is it sets you up for a lot of great opportunities. So you certainly don't need to practice law if you go to law school because that's not a universal experience. Was that close enough to two minutes? That was that was awesome. That's so okay. good. Okay. <laughs> I, try, I kind now, of rushed I'm through just, a lot there, but yeah. And as a good follow up, so Sherry, can you just quickly tell us a little bit about what the LPC that Bora Alaskan Faculty of mm -hmm. Law offers is and your experience uh, there? Uh, well, Bora Alaskan offers the IPC, which is the Integrated Practice Curriculum Program. Um, what happens with uh, Law, law school is that you do articling, which is a year after um, you finish your complete your studies, you uh, work with a firm is my understanding for one year. Um, and then you write the LSAT or uh, my understanding is you can write it before I, I am not too sure I, I can't speak to that as well because we at uh, the Board of Alaskan Faculty of Law, <clears throat> we incorporate uh, IPC into the three years. So you don't do four years like other law schools at the Board of Alaskan Faculty of Law do two and a half years of studies and then one semester your last semester or second last semester ends up being IPC the integrated uh, program uh, curriculum which means that uh, you're placed with uh, a law firm somewhere we all apply and uh, we get interviews and we are placed somewhere and then a lot of times what happens is uh, people are hired straight from there which is really great um, so I did mine with um, Kinaway Legal Clinic um, and, uh, but I ended up uh, at another firm after, of course, but uh, it was such great experience. Like, I'm gonna tell you, like to be able to have that IPC and then uh, work after, we basically, the Borlaskan Faculty of Law will give you practical experience, which is my understanding, not a, lot of, a lot of, not a lot of other law schools give that practical experience. So when I went into practice, I started working, I knew how to do things right away because I'd already have, done the practical part of law so um that's how the ipc program works i hope i kind of explained that i'm just trying to do it in two minutes 
<laughs> yeah, but sorry I've put all this pressure on, on everyone. And we are going to talk a little bit. Um, each representative of each law school is going to talk about what makes their law school unique. And certainly that's one of the things that um, Bora Alaskan has to its advantage. So thank you so much for that, Cherry. And all of this might seem like a lot of information for the prospective students, and um, it certainly is, and it'll take you some time to wrap your head around it. And that's another reason that we're recording this, so you can watch it again. Um, my next question is for Jamie. Jamie, do you think it is important for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people to practice law? What should be the main focus or goal for Indigenous lawyers, or is there one at all? And how do you feel about ha like having to advocate for Indigenous people by going through the colonial system? I'll give you three minutes for this because it's complicated. All right, three, three big questions. Yes, we could do a whole session talking about this. Um, you know, I, I don't like the word should. I think it creates unnecessary pressure and it all, always involves the person who's using the S word, as I call it, is using their own moral judgments and moral compass when they answer a question like that. So I'll just tell you a bit about my experience and, and everyone has their own experience. So when I went to law school, I did not want to practice indigenous law. I wanted to go to Bay Street and I wanted to be a corporate commercial litigator. And despite the fact that I didn't want to be practicing indigenous law, when I got to law school, I found that there were a lot of assumptions that were made because of my Indigenous identity. And a lot of fellow classmates and even professors made an assumption that I would practice Indigenous law. And I found that to be a really unfair assumption. Um, it even went so far in that I was, I was called out in class by professors, for example, in our first year criminal law class, when we got to um, the section in the text in the textbook dealing with the Gladue sentencing principles, which are unique sentencing principles for Indigenous people. Um, the professor asked me what I thought of them in a class of 120 people. And I didn't really think it was fair that just because I was Indigenous that I would have some um, particular perspective on the Gladue sentencing principles. I didn't want to practice Indigenous law and I didn't want to practice criminal law for that matter. Um, so I graduated from law school and I did go work on Bay Street and I didn't practice Indigenous law for the first couple of years of my practice. And, and then I realized that I didn't really care about the outcome of the files that I was working on. And then I sort of came to the conclusion that I would find the practice of Indigenous law more fulfilling than just a general corporate commercial law practice. And so I ended up switching firms and then focusing my practice in that space. But what I will say is that the practice of indigenous law is no longer just litigating indigenous rights against the federal government. Um, I was a solicitor more than I was a litigator. I drafted trust agreements for indigenous communities that were settling claims with the federal government for hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and then I, I developed a tax expertise because there are particular tax rules that apply to Indigenous trusts. So I was a mix of a tax and a trust lawyer, which is purely solicitor's work. And what I've come to learn over the last decade of practicing Indigenous law is that there's a huge demand for solicitors in every area. So you can service Indigenous clients and still practice uh, corporate law. They need advice on complex corporate structuring matters, um, indigenous clients need uh, sophisticated tax law advice. They need corporate governance advice. So, um, you know, whatever the practice of indigenous law is, it's really just serving indigenous clients in whatever area of the law they require legal advice. Um, so don't feel constrained if you want to serve indigenous clients to practicing a particular kind of law. Um, and I think you should do what you feel passionate about and you should serve the clients that you feel passionate about because the practice of law is a very demanding career. And if you don't enjoy what you're doing, then um, you're gonna spend a lot of hours being unhappy and, and stressed out. So uh, that's, that's the only advice I have for you that falls into the should category. You should just do what you enjoy and what makes you feel content and fulfilled. 
That's awesome. Thank you for speaking from your heart, Jamie. That's really meaningful for me to hear. And I think that the students will will um, remember that as well. It's um, it's not easy. It's not easy to be a law student and it's not easy to be an Indigenous lawyer. Um, so, you know, for everyone who is looking to go down this path, I think you have to make sure that you have your ancestors walking with you because you need a lot of strength to get through it. Um, the next question, while we're while we're sharing feelings and while we're we're getting a little deep, I'm going to ask Etienne, do you ever do you or did you ever have times of loneliness because you were the only one in your family studying the law or just in general? And this kind of goes to the last part of the question that we were asking Jamie about, you know, existing as an Indigenous person, knowing that you have your own people's traditions and laws, and yet in order to you know, advance the interests of your community members, you have to play this colonial law game. Yeah, um, there's no doubt um, you're going to feel times of loneliness in, in law school, unfortunately. And, and I think uh, it's just, especially when you start looking at the history of the way uh, cases and the way government has treated Indigenous people, it's, it's hard not to you know, feel down at times and feel like it is a huge mountain that we have to overcome. Um, you know, so I get back to my comments that I've uh, raised earlier about just importance, the importance of having balance when you get there, because, it's, you know, you're going to have some people who are going to be very, like, quite frankly, ignorant of Indigenous people. Or some of them, you'll be the first Indigenous person they've ever met in their life. So it's, uh, you know, they're going to, they're going to try to blend you into being, you know, this, for me, you know, Indian, right? We're, we're, we're all the same, right? And you, you're gonna spend a lot of time educating people, unfortunately. Um, um, things are getting better, I think, in terms of this conversations and discussions that are, that are occurring. Um, some of the case law is a little bit better, you know, some of it's not. But, you know, it is gonna be a challenging time. So I encourage you just to make sure you find balance, understand that those people they just don't know, right? So, you know, it's hard, it's easy to get upset and, and get yourself fired up, but you have to also just be mindful of the fact that, you know, who knows where they came from and what type of upbringing they had, what type of conversation they've been around their lives. And and you just have to just try to just get through this as a, as a full-time job. It's a tool, you know, even though some of the law is not right, it's a tool that you need to become aware, familiar with if you want to use the system against them basically. So that's, that's how I uh, consider uh, that issue. Thank you. Thanks, Etienne. So I think at this point, I'm going to skip a few of the prepared questions and move to what I think is the most important question, because we're not here to scare you away from applying to law school. Um, we're here to, to encourage you because we definitely need more Indigenous lawyers. And uh, as someone working at a law school, I want more Indigenous uh, students to support and I want you to come and join us. So um, I'm gonna ask each of the students, uh, or pardon me, each of our panelists to reflect on one experience that they've had or thing that they've done as a lawyer that was particularly awesome and stands out in their mind. And we picked our um, panelists who are at different places in their career, who come from very different places, who are doing different work. So um, with that, I'm first gonna ask Sherry, would you share your best lawyer experience with us, please? Well, I don't know if there's a best lawyer experience, but I'll, I know we have a little bit of time, like under two minutes, I'll keep it very brief. I uh, feel that uh, oh, I did Sherry, go back to don't rush this one. It's okay. okay. We'll go. We okay. can go a little bit later. Yeah, we can eat into the law school time. Okay, so I did go back to um, uh, school a little bit later in my life. Um, you know, due to a lot of issues, probably when I was younger and so forth. And so um, things were a little bit different for me. But the thing I'm proud of isn't even just the lawyer moment, which I will tell you about that in a second. But it's the fact that I went through an undergrad was successful there. And then, you know, I went into uh, law school, you know, for me, my proudest moment is the fact that I did it. And then my kids saw that, right, my children see that. And now I'm very proud to say that my, um, my oldest applied to law school this year and got into all the law schools she applied for, except for she's still waiting on her admission to Osgood. 
just gonna put that out there. She's waiting for Osgood <laughs> to uh, <laughs> give her her uh, give give their uh, thing for. So she hasn't even replied to any of them because I think that's her number one so far. Um, but I'm very proud of her. I'm very proud that I was able to get through that. And then now my my younger ones have aspirations to do. It's not even a thought. They're just like, I'm going to do this, right? So they saw mom do that, dad do that sort of thing too. Um, but as far as uh, the law, um, I have those days where you know, clients, I get them out on bail or they get um, charges withdrawn. And then they're, you know, a lot of them are like, okay, bye. <laughs> but some days you'll get clients who are like, thank you so much, you know, and they're just, they don't have to be, but for me, just that makes my day. And you don't hear it very often, but I hold on to that for the next time until I hear it again, right? That's just kind of what keeps me going is like, people are, I appreciate that you're there and helping them, especially too, if you're helping indigenous clients or marginalized racialized people, and uh, there's that connection. And then they're always grateful to have you there as another indigenous person assisting them too, which is always great. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that too, from the clients when I, I'll get a phone call, I'm like, you're an Aboriginal lawyer, right? I'm like, yes. And they're like, okay, I want you to work for me. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, you know, so there's that connection there too. So I guess those are probably my best moments. I, I don't know if there's because we're in law right so it's it's not it's not generally a good time when you're meeting clients right so i think those are probably my best moments miigwech miigwech thank you so much yeah i think the the how much it means to an, an indigenous person who's in conflict with the canadian colonial legal system to have someone who they know is if not from their community from a community that gets them and gets it like that is invaluable. And um, the work that you're doing is really important, Sherry. So, so thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, yeah, Jeff, just, I'm sorry, gonna just ask to add, sorry, just to add Amanda, you're, yeah. that just kind of, sorry, it'll just be a second. Um, that is exactly, I think what happens, right? Is that they have that connection and they understand that I understand things. Cause I mean, my dad went to residential school. Um, I was in children's aid. Uh, I grew up in foster care. I was part of the 60 scoop. So I'm able to have that, that understanding with the clients as well. And I think that's what's, what really helps as well. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm sorry, I feel like I've scared everyone now to like go so quickly, which actually I don't feel sorry about that. I'm quite impressed with myself. So Jeff, you go next. Well, if you really want me to kind of slow it down, I can, I, you know, I could talk forever. Um, uh, oh, I know that, Jeff. You know that about me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, when I was thinking about this question, my mind went to um, uh, to, a, to a couple of things. Um, and I'll kind of just walk through them of, of things that really sort of jump out as really positive experiences. Um, one was, uh, was simply getting, um, graduating from law school and then getting called to the bar. It just, it felt like a huge accomplishment. It was something that I had wanted to do for a long time. Um, I didn't have any lawyers in my family either. So I didn't have any sort of immediate people that kind of led me along the way. I, I had to kind of figure out what it meant to become a lawyer and what it took, um, through met, like informal mentors that I reached out. So, uh, getting to that moment and actually getting called to the bar felt like a huge, um, felt like a huge accomplishment and, um, and a real source of pride. Um, but then professionally, I, I suppose kind of the two things that jump out are, um, like first time appearing before a judge by myself for the first time felt like a huge moment and felt, um, uh, like a massive accomplishment, uh, just because it felt like an absolutely nerve wracking experience and I didn't quite know what to expect. Um, so I could talk about a lot of my litigation experiences, which were really fulfilling. Um, but the other one that's more recent that really jumps out at me, and, and I have a bit of a unique path in that I've sort of returned to more of an academic role and I do teaching now at, at Western. Um, it was teaching my first class here at Western as an adjunct it was such a source of pride. Um, I being able to lead a class on on Aboriginal law issues with a group who were so keen and so um, invested in learning more um, and under and trying to improve their understanding, um, even though it was a class with with I didn't have any Indigenous students in my class that first time. Um, it still felt like a fantastic opportunity to to kind of educate the next generation of lawyers and open their eyes to things in their legal education that they may otherwise wouldn't have gotten and it felt like um, uh, a position that carried with it a lot of responsibility, but also so many opportunities. Um, 
so there's there's so many there's going to be so many opportunities for all of you in your in your future too if you're if you're thinking about a career in law um to be able to uh to educate people who are uh you know who want to be supportive who want to um you know the word ally gets thrown around a lot but like who, who who want to know what they can do there's a lot of people out there in the profession who want to do better and know the profession needs to do better um there's a great opportunity for, uh, you know, as we get more and more Indigenous lawyers uh, at the bar to be able to educate their their fellow lawyers as well. Um, and and if I, you know, if I can contribute to that in even some sort of small way, even as an adjunct here at Western, it felt like a fantastic opportunity. And and I, I felt really, uh, really privileged and, and really blessed to be able to get to do that. So. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. Jamie, would you go next, please? Yeah, and I feel like I'm partly responsible for perhaps scaring the students. Um, and so what I will say is that if you decide to go to law school, you have to go in knowing um, how much work it's going to be and how challenging it is. But I also want to say uh, five things very quickly that make it all worthwhile. And the first is that law school, um, they were honestly the, the best years of my life. Um, the people that I now consider my best friends, all I met them all in law school. One of them is now practicing in New York. One of them is in-house counsel for the Toronto Airport Authority in Toronto. And the other one is on this call is my friend Lori, who works at Osgood. And those are all people, uh, and they're Indigenous and non-Indigenous, but those are, those are people that have been my best friends since law school. And those relationships were formed through all of the demands and the stress that came from law school, which really has a way of, of bonding people. Um, and then in terms of actually practicing law, you know, and I'm sure everyone on the call feels this way, there are so many moments that I look back on that really shaped my career and made me feel like I was, like I was doing something that was worthwhile. Um, I've had the honor of appearing in the Supreme Court of Canada twice once on the landmark Daniel, Daniels decision, which addressed the question of whether uh, non-status Indians and Métis people should be considered Indians for the purpose of the constitution, which is just such a huge question that, that is still changing the, the legal landscape in Canada from the ruling in that, in that case. Um, and the other case was on behalf of the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation on um, on the duty of the Crown to consult with Indigenous people when they contemplate projects which have the potential to negatively impact uh, Indigenous and treaty rights. So huge cases, huge honour to be in the Supreme Court. Um, I also had a couple of major wins in my litigation practice, um, challenging the federal government's formation of a brand new First Nation. It's probably the newest First Nation in Canada, the Halapu Mi'kmaq First Nation, which was um, formed in, in Newfoundland. And my opinion, I'm totally biased, but I think the feds completely botched the enrollment process. And there's been years and years of litigation over um, that enrollment. And some of the cases that I litigated in federal court resulted in thousands and thousands of applicants being reconsidered for their membership in Indian status. So that was a huge victory for me. Um, and also the day that I was admitted to the partnership at a national Bay Street law firm, I was the first indigenous woman in the firm's history to be made partner. So that was a pretty proud moment. Jamie, your list is amazing. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the importance of your friends. Every month when I make my student loan payments, I pretend like half of it is paying for my education and the other half is paying for the friends that I met because I would have paid like triple for them. Uh, so thank you for mentioning that. And Etienne, could you go next, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, um, going to law school was, I don't want to deter you also and scare you away from it. It was certainly a challenging experience. However, it was one of the best experiences of my life for sure. And I would not change it for the world. I'm very proud to be being able to help my clients and, and, and do the work that I, that I do. Um, and I wouldn't want to go back and change that. And I, and I cherish my friendships and the connections I've met throughout my career so far. There, are so many different things that I've uh, experienced in my career so far that you know they're all awesome and amazing and that I want to talk to you about. Um, but I'm going to limit to two. Number one is getting called to the bar. 
that's going to be the most rewarding experience of your of probably your career because you everything comes together at that point and you really feel like wow i've done it i've accomplished it you can you hopefully you're gonna be able to attend a call to a bar ceremony and as a bencher it's my favorite part of my role is to attend those call to bar ceremonies and be able to celebrate uh, all the new licensees getting called to bar every time we do it. It's, it's just such an amazing experience every time to see all the happy family and friends because we're up on stage, we get to, because we're presiding over the ceremony, we get to see everyone enjoying it. There's standing ovations. It's uh, in, in my own personal experience, it was the best experience to call them and say, hey, I got called to a bar. Um, so think about that day when, it, when it, it's going to come and work towards that. It's, 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 it's amazing. Uh, in terms of my uh, professional experiences, there's lots like I mentioned, but one that really uh, is gonna stick with me for the rest of my life is the seven youth inquests. I was counsel to the Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School uh, who runs a high school up in, the, in Thunder Bay here uh, for uh, the Nan communities, a number of the Nan communities. And unfortunately seven youth who attended that school unfortunately didn't go home. They were, some of them were found in, in rivers and, and, and they passed away here. And Nan had advocated for a long time for, for an inquest. Um, and it was a real eye-opening experience, even being as an indigenous person to see the broader issues that are out there. You know, my client had the biggest target on their back because they're running the high school. And, and unfortunately these kids passed away under, while they're in their care. But when we started digging down into the issues, we really got into the politics of, you know, who's not stepping up to the plate to honor their obligations, uh, you know, and a number of different issues like that. And for me, it was a, it was a, my client. It was a very important case to them. My, the ED for my, for my client, she sat through the whole entire thing and she was there with me 100%. And that's, you know, being able to work through a, a very complicated file like that with a client is just, it's, it was a very uh, rewarding experience and, and we're, we're really good friends. We keep in touch all the time, even though I'm not their main counsel and all their other work, we still keep in touch. Uh, so that went on for eight months here in Thunder Bay and, and, and the model of the inquest or the, the coroner's court is we speak for the dead to protect the living. And I think that happened. I think there's the kid, the story of the seven kids um, certainly is going to protect the living into the future. And I encourage you to read um, Tanya Talaga's book on it, Seven Fallen Feathers. She's, it's an award-winning book. She does a summary of, of, the, of the proceeding and the stories. And, um, you know, for me, that, that's also been a transition point because uh, that was the second big inquest I was involved with. And just recently, I was selected by the Ontario Coroner's Office to be one of their roster manuals to become a inquest hearing officer in Ontario and my training starts next week and and I just highlight that for you just to show you where a lottery can take you and the path that you know you could go down and for me it's it's results in me becoming an inquest hearing officer now where I'll be the, the presiding hearing officer over inquests that are assigned to me in the future thank you Thank you so much, Etienne, and congratulations. Um, thank you for agreeing to do that work on behalf of our communities, because it, to be sure it won't be easy. Um, so I am alumni of U of T, and I'm just going to jump in and say, I, I articled with an organization called the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted, which is now Innocence Canada. And while I am not a panelist, I just wanted to share that as an articling student, I worked on uh, the case of a non-Indigenous man, a settler man named Glenna Soon who was wrongly convicted of murder about 20 years ago. And uh, as an articling student, I met him in prison and, and had him sign some documents. And we submitted an application to the Minister of Justice for post-conviction review of his file. And a couple of years after that, he received bail pending his, um, the review of his wrongful conviction. And more recently, he was exonerated after set, spending 17 years in different federal institutions across the country. And uh, he's had his name cleared and now he's attempting to get compensation for that wrongful conviction. But on Thursday of last week, he came to talk to my wrongful convictions class that I co-teach at U of T Law. 
And uh, that was a pretty rad experience, getting to invite Glenn to my class to talk about his wrongful conviction. So there are lots of really cool things that you can do with your law degree, both for Indigenous folks in Canada as well as non-Indigenous folks. Um, we have really skipped over a lot of the amazing questions that you asked. So what I'm going to do is actually take all of the questions that haven't been answered and I'm going to share them via email with our panelists and ask them to write up their own little responses. And then we're going to post that somewhere on the internet and we'll send you a link to it. So we'll take the questions from the chat and I'm really grateful to Lori who's been responding to some of the questions in the chat. We'll take those, we'll take the questions that were submitted ahead of time and we'll answer those in writing and we'll give those to you after the fact. But um, for now, I am going to turn to the second part of our presentation, which is giving all of the law school representatives um, an opportunity to briefly introduce themselves and their law school. Um, we are going, oh, Maybe before I do that, because actually our panelists might want to sign off. So um, before we do that, I'm going to thank Jeffrey, Etienne, Sherry, and Jamie for their time. Um, we, I mean, it's pretty obvious how rad all of you are. And uh, we're super grateful that you came and shared just a little bit of your stories. Um, just so you know, Dr. Philip Drew of Queen's Law, who's going to introduce himself um, shortly, I like to call him Dr. Phil in my own head. He has commissioned paintings as gifts for each of our speakers, as well as for Elder Constance, um, by an emerging artist from Sandy Lake, which, uh, whose name is Miles Kakagamic. And Lori is going to pick these paintings up from Miles and arrange to have them shipped to each of our speakers and Elder Constance. So that is our gift for you, which you should look forward to receiving in the mail. Um, but really um, heartfelt thank you from on behalf of myself, the rest of the organizers and all of the prospective law students are, who are here. And of course, you're welcome to stay, um, but you've already done law school, so you don't really need to know how to get in. So, and you have lots of important work to do. So miigwech. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks everybody for coming. And I'm sure you can Google any of the speakers if you want to try to get in touch with them and ask them specific questions as well. Um, can I just add, Amanda, that I think um, I want to put out there that Robin Sutherland, our Dean Hughes, and everybody else at the Borlaskin Faculty of Law are amazing. So that's my pitch as well for Borlaskin Faculty of Law. <laughs> miigwech. It was nice to meet everybody and we'll hopefully see some of you soon. Miigwech. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Sherry. That was a good advertisement at the end. I hope they give you 10% of tuition revenues from Indigenous students who are present here today. Um, I'm just joking, obviously that's not going to happen. Um, okay, so we are now going to move to our short introductions and the first school that is going to be called on is Windsor. So Michelle, would you please unmute and introduce yourself and your school? Uh, bonjour, my name is Michelle Nadi. I am from the Kishinong First Nation. Um, and I have family in Raventown, Delaware Nation, um, Lene Lenape. Um, I am representing the University of Windsor. Um, I have been there for four and a half years. So this is going on the fifth year and the position is becoming full time at this point. Um, and a couple of highlights that I'd like to bring about University of Windsor is our amazing faculty. Um, we have um, Dr. Beverly Jacobs, uh, Sylvia McAdam, uh, Dr. Valerie Waboos, uh, Wendy Hill from Six Nations. We also have Tasha Beads uh, from View of Sudbury. And we also have Arlene Dodge, who is a local lawyer from um, the Kajanong First Nation too. Um, we are the first law school to offer a mandatory Indigenous Legal Orders uh, course that is mandatory for all first years, all incoming students. Um, we are um, offering a pre-law course this year on our campus. Um, and we offered that for our students this past year. We, um, we also um, have a, a week of orientation so that you can come on campus a week beforehand. Um, actually, you'll be there two weeks beforehand. The first for the um, orientation and then secondly for the orientation with the rest of your classmates when your class will be about 167 in size. 
We um, recently created the um, Indigenous Legal Orders Institute. And through the Institute, we bring in Indigenous scholars every month. Um, and we host an Anishinaabe camp every year in Bikeshwanong at Wapu Island. And we're looking to start um, Haudenosaunee camp as well in Six Nations with Dr. Bev Jacobs, who is also Associate Dean. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if I went over my time, but I'll stop there. <laughs> no, it's excellent. I want to go to Windsor now. Uh, no, I'm just joking. I would never go back to law school <laughs> once this is enough. Thank you so much, Michelle. Okay, so Ryerson is the newest law school in Ontario. So I'm going to hand it over to Landon. Are you going to speak? Or yeah, Scott? Uh, no, I'm going to speak. Scott couldn't make it. Um, so my name is Landon Chain. Uh, I'm the student recruitment coordinator at Ryerson Law. I'm, for, or I'm uh, from Métis Nation, Alberta. And we're the new kid on the block. So this is this year right now is the first year Ryerson's had a law school. So we're in the middle of a bunch of firsts. Um, our students are currently establishing their own Indigenous club. Um, and the big thing that separates Ryerson from most of the other Ontario law schools is we also have IPC, uh, like Sherry mentioned, uh, Lakehead has. So when you go to Ryerson, you don't have to do the 10 month articling placement. It's built into the curriculum and there's a work placement component as well. Um, I'm not sure how the uh, employment's gonna turn out from that because we only have first years right now. No one's actually made it all the way through. Um, and on top of that, cause we're a newer school, we focused a lot on technology. So our students have to take mandatory um, coding courses and there's like a technolo or technological intensive they have to take. And they did that a couple of weeks ago. And the focus of that project for them was building an access to justice app on your phone, um, which is a really interesting project. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other high level thing I want you to know about Ryerson before my time's up. Uh, yeah, we're, we're new and lots of firsts and the students have a lot of opportunity to start clubs and initiatives that they want to because none of those things are set in place yet. That's Ryerson. Thank you so much, Landon. I appreciate that. And, you know, Ryerson has taken University of Toronto's title of being the only law school in the downtown core. So they also have a really rad location when real life resumes post COVID. Um, so thank you. And yes, we're so excited for Ryerson. The next on my list is Robin from Lakehead. Hello everyone. My name is Robin Sutherland. I am from Fort Albany First Nation, Treaty 9 Territory, and I am from the Pike Clan. I have lived, learned, and worked in Northern Ontario for all but three years of my life. I have been the Director of Indigenous Relations at the Royal Alaskan Faculty of Law since April of 2018. And my role can be broken down into four categories, recruitment, retention, resources, and relationships. I won't bore you with everything I do because we do a lot here, but basically I act as a support to students before, during, and after they arrive here at law school. I act as a uh, resource to staff and faculty for various events and initiatives, and I work on building and strengthening relationships with our, our broader Indigenous community. Uh, Lakehead is located in Thunder Bay on the territory of Fort William First Nation, signatories to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. It's beautiful historic law building overlooks the downtown North Core with a breathtaking view of Gitche Lake Superior, and Nanabujo, the Sleeping Giant. Only a one and a half hour flight to Toronto, many consider the city and surrounding area a four season paradise with lively food, art, and music scene. Uh, established in 2014, we are the, the now second, uh, thanks to Ryerson, youngest law school in Canada. We are a small school with small class sizes, admitting 65 students per year, as Sherry mentioned. And those are further divided into two sections. So much like the size of a typical high school class. Uh, our three mandate areas, all designed to produce competent lawyers in Northern Canada, include Aboriginal and Indigenous law, natural resources and environmental law, and small town and sole practice law with the integrated practice curriculum. Uh, that IPC component allows our students to build their practical skills while completing their mandatory courses, preparing them as practice ready lawyers upon graduation with no need for articling. Although it is still an option taken up by some. Uh, toward that end, we also have the Lakehead University Community Legal Services Clinic, uh, where students can practice their skills as well. 
Uh, before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission called on all Canadian law schools to offer a course in Aboriginal people in the law in 2015, uh, Lakehead has been offering three mandatory courses, Aboriginal perspectives and Ab Indigenous legal traditions in the first year and Aboriginal legal issues in the second year. Uh, not only do I do my best to support our Indigenous students, as do our faculty, staff and elders, but so too do our Indigenous student support service on the main campus. We've also begun offering a credit in Foundations of Canadian Law during the summer for our incoming Indigenous students. And uh, Thunder Bay has a large and vibrant Indigenous community consisting primarily of Anishinaabe, Nino, Oji Cree, and Métis peoples. Uh, many opportunities to volunteer and engage exist for our students, as one of the reasons our law school was created was to service and establish positive relationships with our surrounding Indigenous communities. What's the main takeaway from Lakehead? Uh, basically, we're a Northern law school intent on preparing lawyers and law practitioners to live and work in northern parts of Canada. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit our website, find us on social media, or contact me directly. Miigwech. Miigwech, Robin. I don't know how long Robin is going to work at Lakehead, though, because the Thunder Bay Tourism Department is probably going to try to recruit him after that sales pitch for the city, which is a beautiful city that has a need for a lot of lawyers. So. Uh, thank you so much, Robin, for sharing that. The next um, school that's going to introduce themselves is Lori from Osgood. Ani Bojo. Uh, my name is Lori Mishapanijma. I'm the manager of Indigenous Initiatives and Reconciliation at Osgood Hall Law School. Um, Bojo, Gejian Kwekdo Kwe, Dijnakaz Mangando Dem, Wakamakong Donjaba. So I'm from Wiki. Both my parents are from Wiki. Uh, and I uh, practiced law for 10 years until I started this position at Osgood. Uh, it's a brand new position. And it went with a lot of initiatives that we have tried to implement um, since uh, the calls to action uh, were um, put out by the TRC. So, um, just to let you know, so Osgood is in Toronto. We are um, at York University, which is in the northern part of Toronto. The subway does go there. <laughs> it's just as fast as any other place. And also the rents aren't as high up here. <laughs> so, um, we are easily accessible on the TTC. Uh, and uh, we are um, have been doing an amazing job at our law school for many years. As Etienne said, uh, we have a long tradition of um, indigenous curriculum, amazing indigenous curriculum at our school. Uh, and we continue that to this day. We implemented a mandatory indigenous and law requirement at our school in 2018. Uh, so we um, are different than any other school in that regard because we don't make you do a particular class. We have a basket of courses. So we have five different courses that range from seminars to lectures and uh, you know, three hour classes, papers, exams, there's just a diversity of courses that also range from like uh, Indigenous and settler relations, but also Indigenous law as well. We also have the Anishinaabe law camps, which we hold every fall. Uh, one we hold at Nawash, which is on the Bruce Peninsula, and we hold that law camp with John Burroughs, who's a, an amazing Indigenous law expert. You may see, you'll Google him, you'll see. And then we also hold an Anishinaabe law camp at Rama First Nations with one of our professors, Jeffrey Hewitt, uh, who is Cree, but has worked with Rama First Nation for many years. Uh, so we have those two areas. We also have um, a, a clinical program called the Indigenous Intensive, which has been running for uh, 25 years since the Oka crisis. That's when students at Osgood got together grassroots um, initiative to make sure that we have a clinical education for Indigenous uh, students or people who want to work with Indigenous communities. We also have an amazing clinical uh, law, pro cl clinical programs at Osgood uh, that uh, have enough, we have enough space for most students to complete a clinical, which is comparable to Osgood and Ryerson's um, practice programs. So uh, I think my two minutes are up, but we have lots lots of other things at Osgood. One of the main things I just want to say is OISA, the Osgood Indigenous Students Association is an amazing family. And that is one thing that you would have definitely access to by coming to Osgood. Uh, they're, um, they, they're an amazing support for each other and um, are great mentors for you if you decide to join Osgood. Miigwech. 
Miigwech, Lori. Thank you. And just for the students who I see some people are furiously taking notes. So this is not meant to be the only introduction you ever get to any of these law schools. This is so you can put a face to a name and you can see who you should be contacting with follow-up questions because all of us on this call, our whole job, well, not our whole job, but, but a part of our job is to answer the questions of prospective Indigenous students and to try to woo you to our schools. So um, now you're seeing us and you can follow up with us. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Western. Hi, everybody. Oh, am I on? Okay, great. Hi everybody, my name is Danielle Lacoste. I am the Assistant Dean of Admissions and Recruitment at Western Law, and I work with my associate Stacy Chambers, who's also on the call today. And you may recall getting an email from Stacy confirming your registration for this event today. So we're happy to hear from you at any time, and perhaps at this moment I'll ask Stacy to just put our, our email and our uh, website into the chat so that you'll have that available to you. So um, yeah, that's a great point that Amanda raises about this is not your only opportunity to hear about uh, what the law schools have to offer. Just so you know, we offer every year a law school application workshop in the fall. We also offer special information sessions, pre-law association uh, sessions. So, so you can look for all of that on our website in the fall. But I do want you to know just a few highlights today that we have an indigenous applicant category at Western Law School. And uh, we strongly encourage applications from Indigenous students. We want to grow our student, uh, Indigenous student population. And you can see all the eligibility criteria for that uh, category uh, online. And we give you an additional space in your personal statement to talk about your Indigenous heritage. Uh, we want to learn as much as we can about you. And we take a very holistic approach uh, to your application. So uh, definitely keep us in mind when it comes time to. Uh, to uh, find your law school application. So at Western Law in first year, you're exposed to a lot of Indigenous legal issues just through the regular courses that you would take in, in constitutional law, property law, criminal, criminal law, that type of thing. Uh, but in second year, we do have an intensive course that you take. You take only one course in January and it is in, in actually two courses and one of them is Indigenous law. And other courses that we offer in the area include Aboriginal law, Indigenous legal traditions, um, but uh, I think it's really helpful to know, as Jamie mentioned on the panel, is that you may be interested in areas of law other than Indigenous law. And so we offer a wide range of courses for you. Uh, for example, we have eight different curricular streams. You don't have to choose a stream, but we offer guidance about the different courses that we would recommend for any particular area of interest. And each of those streams outlines a number of experiential options that are available to you. So that's where you get to do a little bit more hands-on work. Uh, we have a number of professors who teach in the Indigenous law area. Uh, for example, our Indigenous scholar, Professor Frankie Young, uh, she offers uh, students a Western law read and study course, which focuses on critical legal issues that apply to Indigenous peoples in Canada. And like Jamie, who was on our panel today, she also practiced law, uh, trust law, as it related to Indigenous legal trust before she came to Western, and you got a chance to meet our adjunct professor, Jeff Warnock. So I encourage you to visit our website and, and review the bios of all our profs to get a sense of their levels of expertise. Um, Etienne mentioned the importance of mental health supports and uh, wellness supports when you're at law school. I'm pleased to tell you that we have a full-time in-house wellness counselor at Western who offers students one-on-one -on -one support. It's, uh, this person is, is just for our law students. And we also offer a number of uh, wellness activities. We place a high premium on student wellness uh, and we have a lot of events and a wellness committee and uh, things like that. So our students are very active and engaged in that respect. Um, my la last couple of things I wanna mention, the most important is our free LSAT prep course for Indigenous uh, Black and low income students. Unfortunately, we had to put it on the back burner this past year due to COVID. We do like to offer that in person if you are in our region but we are contemplating remote or hybrid delivery uh, this summer. And you can read more about that on our webpage. So we are offering that course from uh, May to July. So feel free to reach out for more information about that or see our website. We too have an Indigenous law camp. We offer it about every other year. Uh, in the past, it's been the Chippewas of the Thames First Nations and the Walpole Island First Nation. And finally, our other opportunities include some of our, as I mentioned, experiential options. So we have, uh, we participate in the Extractive and Indigenous Affairs Moot, 
uh, we have, uh, we offer the uh, Kowalskamon talking circle. That's a non-adversarial exercise where a dispute is resolved. And our students have the opportunity to take advantage of uh, the Deb Weiwen internship with the Ministry of the Attorney General, uh, where they provide community education and legal assistance to Indigenous communities. So I will stop there. Thank you for your kind attention. And thank you, thank you very much for joining us today. It really means a lot to have this opportunity to chat with you. Thanks so much, Danielle. Okay, Dr. Phil, over to you. Tell us about Queens. I like to call Queens the Goldilocks School because we're not too big, we're not too small, we're just right. And, um, you know, uh, I'm, I, I have to be the first to say I'm not, in, I'm not an Indigenous person myself, but I'm from Sioux Lookout, if that makes any difference. So um, uh, I am a graduate of Queen's and my position at Queen's is Assistant Dean of uh, Juris Doctor and Graduate Studies and uh, re recruiting admissions and Indigenous coordination falls under my, uh, my umbrella. And I also have with me today our admissions um, uh, manager, uh, Andrew Van Overbeek. Uh, and you know, if, if you decide that you want to uh, investigate Queens as a potential choice for a law school, Andrew will be generally the person that you are dealing with. Um, we at Queen's will usually have, or we will have again, an Indigenous uh, support coordinator who will be a member of NAILS. Um, our Indigenous support coordinator moved to the law school, or correction, to the business school from the law school in uh, December, uh, for those of you who've ever known Anne Deer. And we'll be replacing Anne uh, in the next month uh, with a new Indigenous coordinator. So uh, at, at Queen's, we have a lot of support for students. Uh, one of the reasons we do is that virtually nobody who goes to Queens actually comes from Kingston. Uh, our students come from all over the province, all over the country. Um, and uh, as a result, they, they come together as a community and in many respects, Queens becomes their family. Uh, they don't go home uh, uh, at night to their own homes. They go home to the a place that they're renting or the place that they're living for the time being, because uh, so many of the students just don't, uh, aren't originally from Kingston. Um, one of the uh, things we have at Queen's as well is very strong uh, relationship with the local uh, Indigenous communities, uh, mostly the Haudenosaunee uh, in particular. Uh, we have uh, in fact, we've got a, a clinic on Akwesasne uh, in which students uh, will uh, work with lawyers in providing legal services uh, to people on the reserve. Um, I think the main thing about Queens for uh, people who are interested in coming is that whole concept of family and community. Uh, that's what we are about. That's the difference between Queens Law, I think, and most other law schools is the fact that uh, everybody comes to Queen and comes together. We have a very, very active Indigenous Law Student Association uh, headed up by our, um, our Indigenous Support Counselor. Uh, and uh, involved in that too is uh, our own, men uh, as with Western, we have our own mental health counselor as well, uh, who works closely with uh, ILSA and with all the other organizations in the school. We are undergoing uh, the indigenization of our curriculum. Uh, for those of you who are aware of uh, the former name of Queen's Law School, uh, one we're not allowed to say anymore, we underwent a huge um, process this year to dename the law school. Uh, and it has brought indigenous issues uh, to the forefront and has really opened uh, communications and uh, discussions on indigeneity and what it means and uh, what our roles are vis-a-vis uh, -vis our communities in Canada. So uh, if you're interested in coming to Queens, we'd love to have you come. And, uh, but having said that, um, there are eight great law schools in um, the province of Ontario. And the more people we can get into our law schools, the more Indigenous people we can get through our law schools, the better uh, Indigenous people will be overall because we need to build that core group of people in the province. 
and um, and build the knowledge. And whatever we can do at Queen's to help you, I'm more than happy to. Uh, if it's answering questions, uh, whether or not you come here, it doesn't really matter to us as long as you get into the profession and you do well. And if we can help you in any way, you let me know. Okay, thank you. Miigwech. Thanks so much, Phil. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's a really important point to make. We're all here and we're doing this together because we all have an interest in helping you get into any of our law schools. You know, we'll be competitive with each other after hours and Lori and I will arm wrestle every time we see each other, but not for students. So um, I think that's a really important point to make. I'm also grateful that you clarified what you meant by Goldilocks. I was a bit worried you were gonna come and sleep in my bed and eat my porridge. Um, but that is not what he meant. So uh, with that, I'm going to, and I, I'm cognizant that we're running over time, but I'm still going to tell you my jokes because that's what U of T has to offer. It's my sense of humor. Um, <laughs> Danielle, could you tell us a little bit about Ottawa, please? Thanks, Amanda. Um, I am cognizant of time and I have three wee babies uh, who are upstairs and I hear some crying, so I'll be real quick. Um, my name is Danielle Lucier. I'm Red River Métis from Treaty One territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, but I have benefited daily um, from occupying space on unsurrendered Algonquin territory in Ottawa, Ontario um, for about 20 years. Um, I'm in a long-term relationship with the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa, where I serve as um, Director of Community Engagement um, and uh, Indigenous Education. Um, our team, you know, like the other faculties, we, we have a team of folks who are here to improve access to the profession for Indigenous peoples. We have a full-time Indigenous learner advocate who serves as something of an auntie in residence. Um, she can help you with everything from housing and getting access to, to medical care in our city, um, all the way through to, you know, hosting our community beating circle and um, in, in before times and hopefully after times, you know, the, the lunches and, and the, the professional development and career services and support specifically for our learners. Um, we do have academic skills development um, support that is exclusively for our community members. We have a part-time legal writing mentor. Uh, we have an academic mentor. Um, we have quite a developed alumni mentorship program um, through our brothers and sisters in law peer mentorship. You know, uh, if if Philip is is the if Queens is um, is the Goldilocks, you know, we are Canada's largest law school. Um, so our 1L class does have a little over 300 students every year. Um, and with size comes opportunity, right? We we have a, a panoply of course offerings. We have options in all kinds of different areas. If you want to target environmental law, or if you want to pursue the option in Indigenous laws and legal orders, and so on. Um, I do hear the babies crying, so I am going to have to. I am going to have to sign off. But I would be so pleased uh, to hear from any of you. Si je suis francophone, j'ai vu qu'il y avait des francophones. If anybody prefers to speak in French, um, I'll muddle my way through the chip, although uh, I'm not strong. Um, but we. Would would be so so pleased to hear from you and help you on your path uh, to the profession um, if we can do anything to support please let us know merci merci thank you cousin um i really appreciate it and yeah all of us are going to answer your questions later so very quickly you've already heard who i am um u of t uh has as a point of pride that we are an academic institution first. So unlike some of the law schools where the, pro, the, um, the law practice program is integrated and there's a very uh, strong practice focus, U of T very much prides itself on teaching the theory of law and um, providing a very strong academic experience. So um, one thing that really surprised me as a student was buying my textbooks and very quickly realizing that the person who wrote the textbook was also my instructor. Um, so we have a lot of very well-known legal academics that work at the University of Toronto. And that's not to say that we don't give students opportunities through our legal research and writing program and through experiential education opportunities to learn how to become a lawyer. My favorite semester that I did as a student was at Downtown Legal Services, which is our on-campus legal clinic, where I got to carry crim files as well as family law files, and I did that. So um, 
it's not that we're not well-rounded, but we certainly uh, do have a very academic focus. We also have uh, the highest placement rate in terms of students getting Bay Street jobs. So Jamie talked a little bit about her experience doing economic development and being the first Indigenous woman who was a partner at, um, at a Bay Street firm. And she's not one of our alumni, so it's totally possible to go to Bay Street from all of the different law schools. But if you want to get paid, going to U of T is uh, not a bad place to be because a lot of our students do get um, really great jobs out of that there. We have a beautiful new building, which unfortunately most of the students are not attending class in, but they still have access to, which is right in downtown Toronto, just south of the Royal Ontario Museum. And it's an absolutely gorgeous space that I love so much. My office is attached to the space for the Indigenous Law Students Association. Um, it was built specifically in on campus so that we have all of the ventilation so we can do ceremony in that space and so we can meet and visit and do that. Um, uh, our Indigenous Law Students Association are some of the most amazing people and they um, and getting to support those students is absolutely hands down the best part of my job. Um, and I am going to use the very best part of the law school as a segue to our closing, which is I have Elder Constance as our elder in residence and I get to sit with her and she's my traditional auntie and I'm her traditional niece and we do work with both the settler students and the Indigenous students in groups and one on one. Um, together. And there's lots more information on our website about different things at U of T. But I think what we'll do now is we'll ask Elder Constance to close the formal part. So everyone is here is going to be um, entered in the draw. So keep an eye out on your email to see if you are one of four lucky folks who's going to get a bunch of stuff from the law schools. And then you can save it for next holiday season and re-gift it if you don't want to keep any of it. You're welcome to do that. Um, we're going to do a closing and then we're going to take a two minute break, frankly, because I had about four cups of coffee this morning because like Danielle Lucier, I also have a little one and that is what parenting necessitates. So we're going to have a quick break for um, for the washroom. And then if anyone has any questions, we have a whole bunch of questions that we received about the um, admissions process. You're welcome to stay on to uh, ask those questions. And, um, but you're also welcome just to ask them after the fact if you have to go. So um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Elder Constance. I'm gonna say thank you to everyone for your time and attention today. It's amazing. It's so good to see all of your faces. I hope I see a lot of your names in my email inbox and that you're asking us questions after the fact, but we're gonna be in touch to let you know when the video is available. Um, and also when that list of additional questions is available and where you can find it. So Auntie, would you please close and I'm just going to pause the recording but are interested in the answers so well, I'll be here for about five more minutes after that I'm on academic advising so okay great thank you um so let's move on to the prepared question so there's a number of people who are still on the call so I think um the first question and I'm just going to throw it out there and then let Danielle Michelle Lori Landon um the gentleman from Queen's Law whose name escapes me, I'm so sorry, but your Andrew. beard is amazing, <laughs> Andrew, um, <laughs> might answer some of these as well. So um, the first question is, when can you apply for law school? And any of you can answer it. Scramble. You can apply to law school um, after two years of undergrad or completing your undergrad. I recommend completing an undergrad. Uh, it's very rare that students get in after two years of um, an undergrad program, um, but also you'll just be more prepared. Um, like, especially um, like indigenous students as someone who is indigenous, like I, I had a hard time in school and I uh, had to learn basically colonial ways of education. I had to adapt what my family taught me. And it's really hard to do that in an undergrad program in two years. Like. So sometimes a lot of students, they might be adapting for the first year or two. So their grades might not be as high and your grades might increase over the years. So your GPA will get stronger and stronger the longer you're there. Um, and not that like GPA like does have an impact, um, but also so does your community experience and your LSAT. Um, but definitely 
Yeah, I would. Uh, so if you are applying after you are completing your undergrad, you're looking at um, writing an LSAT like in the summer of your um, before your fourth year and then you're applying in the first term of your fourth year, generally. That's awesome, Lori. I agree with you. Anyone have anything to add or should we keep moving? Yeah, I think at most of the schools, you're gonna be far more um, competitive if you've, if you've completed or you're at least on the path to completing your undergrad. And, um, and also, yeah, most of the schools like at U of T, we, when we look at grades, we do a one-third one, one third grades, one-third LSAT, one-third personal statements as well for all of our applicants. But we only look at the best three full-time years of your undergrad program. So if your first year was a bit like sketchy because you were getting used to doing post-secondary education, that gets eliminated completely if you have three full-time years after that. So you have to look carefully at each of the law schools admissions policies, but generally the more you have under your belt, the better. Um, so the next question is what steps should we take to prepare and what resources did you find useful in preparing as an Indigenous student? This is a pretty open-ended question. So Landon, you've been through the program most recently. Do you want to take this one? Sure. In terms of like actually preparing for law school, there's not much you can do because it's so different from most undergrad programs. Um, in terms of preparing for an Indigenous program, for as an Indigenous student, it's really unfortunate the uh, summer program isn't running anymore because that was the best way for me personally because you get connected with a bunch of... Um, Wait, it's not that it's not running, it's running in a different form. Sorry. Okay. Um, but you, you get to meet like all the, or most of the other Indigenous students going to your law school and as well as the other law schools in Canada. Uh, and establishing a network with all those students. Um, but in terms of preparing, otherwise, I, 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 I don't really <laughs> have any major advice on that. No, I think that's good. And we talked a little bit about LSAT prep already and taking the courses. And Danielle mentioned the LSAT prep course that they have at Western. U of T offers something similar. So you know, making sure you're prepared before you go into that test, I think is really important. And then the advice that um, one of the panelists gave, I can't remember who said it, but just making sure that whatever you take in undergrad, you are super interested in it so that you knock it out of the park. Um, you know, taking a specific, a specific program so that, you know, like if you think that political science is gonna make you more likely to get into to law school, that is the case if you are interested in political science and you're going to do super well in your classes. But if you have no interest in political science, but you would do super good in a music program, because that is an area of interest that you have, then take music. Because we have lots of folks who do music. We have folks with dance backgrounds at law school. We have folks with engineering degrees at law school. Um, so it just really is whatever you're the most interested in. Um, what are eligibility requirements? Are there a prerequisite course? Lori, do you wanna answer that one? There's no prerequisite course. Like Amanda just said, your undergrad can be anything, can be music, can be biology, mine is in social work, can be anything that you love, that you're passionate about and that you will do well at. If you, like I wouldn't do something that you're not passionate about and that you like aren't gonna spend the time and effort to get, A's and B's in those classes. Um, so you can take basically anything. The only requirement is the undergrad or the two years. But like I said, I would recommend doing a full undergrad. Um, and then the other issue, the other thing is just writing the LSAT. That is the other um, requirement. Uh, it's not a class, but it, is, it does take work to prep for that. Like if you, especially if you take a prep course and then obviously um, doing your practice exams, like Jamie explained, she dedicated a lot of time to that, uh, to doing well. Uh, some schools, depending on which school you wanna go to, your LSAT might not have, like it depends on what school, like for um, Osgood, if you, have an, if you have somewhere in the 140s, you would definitely be considered, whereas other schools are more strict with their LSAT requirement. So you just wanna check in with each school to see whether your LSAT is um, up to their, uh, that school specific requirement. 
That's awesome, Lori, because you also answered the next question, which is it possible to get into law school with a bad LSAT? So, I mean, it, it you know, there's no like cutoff for any of the schools, absolutely, because if your LSAT mark isn't as strong, but your grades are spectacular and you can write a really good personal statement, then your application will probably be pretty strong. Um, so I think, you know, you want to do the best that you can, but you also don't like need to get a 180 to get in. Is 180 the highest score? See, this is, I have blocked a lot of them. Yes, memories. 180 is the highest score. Okay, you don't need that. So you're good. You don't need that. Um, okay, so let's, I'm going to skip ahead. Um, this is a really good question and maybe Robin could answer it. Do you have any advice on ways to make my application stand out amongst other promising applicants? Sure, a couple of things. I think the most important is your personal statement. That's really a place for you to, to make yourself shine and sell yourself. You can also, in that, in that section, you can also explain any anomalies that you might have in your, your GPA or maybe even your LSAT score. You can explain anything uh, that might be um, declining in those regards. Um, also, it's also good while you're taking your, your undergrad to seek out uh, uh, volunteer extracurricular activities if possible. Third recommendation is to kind of form relationships with your professors. So when you're asking them to write a reference statement for you, they can actually write about you because they know you. Um, uh, you, you get to know them, establish that relationship, they can write a more um, wholesome personal statement. Um, and that's all that I can think of for now. Anyone else? Yeah, anyone want to add? Andrew, do you want to add? I saw your head nodding. Yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, with Robin uh, on all of those points. A personal statement is very important. Um, I can speak for Queens a little bit because we, we do have a, a separate category for for Indigenous applicants, and in that you're given an additional space to to write about uh, your experiences and what you're hoping to bring to law school and what you're hoping to get out of law school as well, um, because we do believe that it's a two way street when it comes to that. So uh, uh, definitely take full advantage of that when it's uh, when it comes to your writing and, and, and leave yourself time, if you, you know, the time to, to put some energy into it, right? Uh, when it comes to your profs, you, uh, uh, Robin did mention, you want to establish those relationships. And if you're currently in school, it's the best time to do it. Go to office hours. If you don't have access to office hours or you aren't able to go, see about meeting with them on, on your own outside and let them know that your intention is to apply to law school. Because even if it's not this year, uh, they will a lot of times keep tabs on, on what you're doing uh, and you'll start to see synergies between the reference they write for you and, and stuff that's happening in your personal statement. And when we see that, we uh, it really feels like a, a way more robust application and it, it really does stand out from, from people where and I'll, I'll be completely honest, I read a lot of references where it's obvious that the prof doesn't really know this student, right? They're, they're just talking about stats and, and they talk about their research a lot. And, and that's not the, not that it's a bad reference, it's just not a great one. And uh, the, the best way to get a great reference is to establish that relationship. Well, and that's easy for us as Indigenous people. I mean, we don't want to speak in pan-Indigenous ways, but one thing we're good at is building relationships. So, you know, taking the time to do that, it, I think is important. The other thing I would just say, so um, at U of T, we have an optional essay for folks, uh, for everyone who's applying. And when you don't use every possible space to tell the admissions committee who you are and why you want to go to law school, then it's lazy. So whenever I get, whenever I get an application and people haven't done the optional essay, I mark it down. Because, you know, I think in the same way that you want your reference letters to be as strong as possible, you want to say as much as you can to the committee and you don't want to repeat yourself. So you also don't want to write the same thing that you've written in your personal statement in your optional essay. Um, tell us two different stories. You've had a whole life. You're probably at least 25 years old by the time you're going to law school. That's, you know, a quarter of a century. And we want to tell us some interesting things about you and why you would be make a good contribution to the profession. Um, okay, moving on. This is a good question. Uh, are there standard classes that you have to take at law school? Can you choose some classes? classes? 
um, can you lower your course load? So I'll give this question to whoever wants to answer it, but maybe they could also answer it in combination with a little bit of what Jamie talked about during the panel, which is the distinction between barrister and solicitor work. And Laurie, do you want to take this one? Yeah, so um, every school is different, but generally the first year curriculum is very, um, um, it's like most of those classes are mandatory and maybe one, maybe two, maybe zero of your courses are ones that you can choose. Osgood in particular, you can have, you can choose one course in the second term of your first year, but it's generally all mandatory. And we are regulated by the law, the Federation of Law Societies in Canada. So there are some things that every law school has to um, teach their students in order for them to graduate and um, be able to article with their respective law societies. So generally you're doing um, contract law, property law, uh, constitutional or public law, um, as uh, torts law is usually also um, mandatory as well as um, I think I think that's oh criminal Same law property. criminal property yes criminal I did say property criminal law is usually um, mandatory as well um, and uh, and then you do uh, your oh and then usually like civil procedure or legal process or legal research and writing like every school calls it something different but it's usually something along those lines. Um, are usually mandatory in your first year. And then most schools, I think maybe Lakehead is an exception, it, um, had, like their um, second and third year of your law school experience will be completely your choice, except that you wanna have a well-rounded legal education. So talking to your academic counselors at your particular schools would be important. Like definitely you want to take courses that meet what career path you're on. Some people don't know what their career path is yet. So definitely there's lots of choice. Um, and then you, uh, so like I said, you want to take courses that might, um, like you want to have a well-rounded legal experience. So you might want to take courses that might help you with passing the bar exam or the barrister and solicitor exam that Jamie had mentioned. And that's where, um, so your, you know, solicitor is going to be like drafting, drafting and um, uh, contracts and um, like commercial law. Uh, and then so uh, barrister is going to be like your litigation type courses. Um, criminal law, um, lawyer as negotiator, lawyer, trial advocacy, uh, whatever courses that what what the school you have choose. Um, but with that, you want to take a balance of each of those, even if you are really particularly interested in crim law, I wouldn't take all crim law after that, I would take a, a mix because you do have to write the barrister and the solicitor exams. So taking things like trusts and estates and uh, commercial law, business associations, those will help you in your being a well-rounded lawyer, but also helping you pass your barrister and solicitor exams. Um, is that right? Did I? Yeah, I think that was awesome, Lori. I, I, you know, the point I just wanted everyone to make, so you might think you might go into law school thinking you're going to do one thing and totally veer in a different direction because there's an area of law that you'd never even heard of. And then you find it super interesting. You have a great professor, you have a great experience working in a clinic. So like keeping yourself open. And I just wanted to make sure everyone recognizes that when you graduate from law school in Canada, unlike in, in the UK where people specialize out of law school, they either are a barrister or they are a solicitor. Everyone who gets called to the bar in Ontario, at least, I don't know about the other jurisdictions, but I suspect is yes, a barrister and a solicitor. Yeah, so you can, you can do it all. Um, so I think the next question Amanda, to I'm, add to that, yeah, one, I ahead, think Stacey. the second question was if you could do like lower your course load. So at oh, Western, yeah. we do have that option for the extended time JD. So it's kind of like a part-time, um, course load. So instead of taking just three years to finish your degree, you can spread it out to up to six. So when you apply, you would indicate, okay, I'm interested in maybe doing the extended time. And, and when we admit you, you're not held to that. You can still do the full time if you want. Um, but then you can indicate, okay, the first year I might just take three courses or whatever, and then you can spread it out and you can always switch to full-time later on. 
So that is an option yeah. for someone who wants to work part-time or has different commitments that you don't have to do the full-time course load. Most schools do have extended um, time and you, uh, but you have to get approved for it and usually have to have a reason. Like yeah. you can't just be like, I want to do part-time because I want to. You usually have to get, like pitch why you need to do part-time. Um, and I like just as someone who has a t like attended law school and maybe others will agree. Um, and some like you can do a portion of extended time. Like if you are a, a female or a male and you're taking parental leave, that might be a reason why you do extended time for maybe one of the years, but not any of the other years. That's a possibility as well. But generally I would recommend um, doing the program full time just because there are lots of things attached to your year and going through law school, like job, like summer jobs, articling, um, and career um, connections and um, uh, job opportunities or career opportunities are connected to your year in law school. But it does, right doesn't stop you from need accommodation. Definitely accommodation. And that's the way you have to do it. That's the way you have to do it. Um, I'd just like to add something really quick, uh, and I'm assuming a lot of the other law schools here, but I'm not going to speak for anybody specifically. Um, I know that we kind of touched on the summer program earlier, but there's an opportunity to get a property law course if you take advantage of that opportunity, or at least I know the program's being redeveloped or, or, or changed up a little bit, but there was an opportunity to get a lighter load during 1L uh, through doing that. But beyond that, uh, I'm assuming that most law schools have clinic opportunities that you can get credit for and, and, and whatnot. So there are opportunities to actually um, I know at Queens you can take that during the summer. So if you wanted to take a summer clinic opportunity, then then you could actually have a lighter load during your school year. So some people choose to spread out um, their study that way. Uh, we do have a part-time program too, but it's not what most people assume a part-time program is and that you take your courses in the evening or not. It's really a half-time program where um, where you, you'd be in the same classes as any other JD student. You're just doing half the load over six years instead of three. Uh, and, and Lori touched on it. I, I don't, obviously everybody's situation is different and maybe that's all you could handle. You can apply through part-time, uh, but like Lori mentioned, most students that are in our part-time program start as a regular JD student and move into a part-time for reasons that, that, that are their own. Um, so it, it's something to be mindful of, uh, that the, those opportunities do exist, but there is a benefit to being fully engaged in your legal studies. There's all kinds of opportunities that, that arise at law school that would be hard to, to take advantage of if you weren't there all the time. And I'm not even talking about just academics. I'm talking about all the other stuff that's attached to, to your law school experience. Yeah, um, just uh, like as a note to that as well, and this might speak to some, because some schools have combined programs. So um, a, a JD along with a master's of social work, like at U of T um, or at Osgood, we have a, a master's, uh, a combined program with a master's of environmental studies. I will say from like, like Andrew was saying, like you, you it's good to be, to kind of stay in your cohort because you get that connection to your peers and your study groups. And that is an important, that is an important part of law school, uh, whether like maybe you're not, maybe you're an introvert, so maybe you like doing things on your own, but it is important for you to connect with your classmates. And I do know that the experience of um, those students in those combined programs, they start in one year and then they come back in a different cohort and there is a bit of disconnect for them that we have to bridge to close, like we have to help them bridge that gap. Um, so just keep that in mind, um, but also awareness of the combined programs that exist at the various schools. Thank you so much, Lori and Andrew. I think that it's, you know, when you are looking into schools, if you want to do a part-time program, like looking very specifically at each school's policy, because as a, as a policy, U of T doesn't offer a part-time program, but we do as an accommodation. So, and, and I agree wholeheartedly with what uh, Lori and Andrew are saying, like the value of sticking with your classmates and like having that, I like to call it a shared suffering 
where you're like with your group of people who are going through the same time, the same thing as you are at the same time. Cause law school is very much like a slingshot. Like all of a sudden you're here and you're in one L or you're in orientation and then you're getting called to the bar and it goes so fast. And, you know, there are so many things like you're already getting your first year summer, your first year summer jobs when you're in second term of first year. And then when you're in the summer, you're applying for when you're in the summer of 2L, you're applying for your articling position, like everything happens so quickly. So like being together with your, your classmates is good. Um, but there's obviously people have life commitments. So those are important too. Um, okay, my next question is for Landon as the most recent law school student. Can you tell us what are the standard classes? You know what, let's not talk about the standard classes because like I think Lori's already covered that. Um, but can you tell us how long law school classes are? Can you tell us about what they're like? Do you get called on randomly like in the movies? All right, so in terms of like what are law school, well, let's start with the length. At, I went to Osgood, so classes varied depending on the credit weight. So however many credits a course was is how many hours it is a week. So some courses are three hours, some you'll have, um, it'll be two hours, but twice a week. Some are really short, they're an hour and a half. Um, it's often not like it is in the movies and you don't get called on very often. Um, I think I only had one prof in my entire time at Osgood who actually did that. And when he did, it like wasn't scary. If you didn't know, you just said, you don't know. And he would be like, okay, next person. Um, but it's a very different style of teaching that I was used to. They call it Socratic method. Some profs, they just stand like at the front of the class and they just talk for three hours. And it's your job to take all the notes. And like, I would say less than half of my profs actually used um, PowerPoints or like visual aids or handouts or any of that. So it was a, a bit of a culture shock for me going in because you're, I just wasn't used to that. I was used to going to school and you get your, you have a PowerPoint presentation where you can just kind of copy paste the notes or um, your prof gives you aids. Um, and what else is it like? It's just, it's a lot more. It's, it's honestly like going back into high school. And I don't know if anybody else agrees with that, but like you, you go from being in a university where you're like very independent and your class schedule, you have a lot of control over. And then you go into first year and it's like, you're with this same group of students through the, the same five classes that you don't really have control over of. And you're in a much smaller faculty than you were in undergrad. Cause your faculty will be like between a hundred to 300 students, depending on the school you go to. So it kind of like puts you back in like a high school vibe, which is kind of weird. Um, and somebody just posted a question in here that I can answer because it's on, along the same lines about the difference between undergrad exams and law school exams. Um, law school exams are oftentimes 100% finals. So I wasn't used to that in undergrad. I was used to usually like having like an ass or assignments worth like 40 to 50% of the grade participation and then an exam component. In law school, generally your exams are 100% finals, uh, which changes your preparation method and also makes the exams a bit more stressful because it's like you get one shot. There's, you don't really have an opportunity to mess up. Um, and they're usually a mixture of what's called a fact pattern, which is like a, a factual scenario. And then you're asked to apply the law or represent some side um, and then a policy question which asks you to like think theoretically about the law. Can I interject just so you're not scared off? <laughs> yes, they are 100% finals. Yes, it's like learning a new language. Law school is learning a new language. Colonial law has been very painful for indigenous people. Uh, education has been very painful for indigenous people. And that has put indigenous people in a certain, at a certain, position when trying to access those two things, specifically a legal education and, and uh, entrance into the legal profession. Um, so that's why, the, and the, this was mentioned a couple times, but that's why the summer program at the Indigenous Law S uh, Center in Saskatoon was um, started because it helped students prepare for that 
kind of culture shock, that new language, that new way of doing exams, that new way of reading cases, it prepared students for that. And it is changing, like by the time you apply and come, that program will be melded into something a bit different, um, but something similar. But from that, um, also schools have been working really hard some schools, I'm not gonna say all schools, but many schools have been working hard to help indigenous students specifically, not just any students, all law schools have academic success programs, but some law schools are working to um, culturally safe indigenous academic success programs. So I know Lakehead has one and, I, and at Osgoode we have one, it's called Kandaswa Chinaka Gawain. Other schools may have them as well. I'm not sure who else is left on the call, um, but we work with the students to help you adapt to that shift in the way exams are, and the way exams are written, the way classes are given, the way your readings are done and the amount of readings. We are there to help you to adapt. And every, like many schools have um, indigenous initiatives, managers or student supports or like those, those supports are there to help you transition to those different kinds of testing methods and uh, teaching methods. That's that's awesome, Lori. I, I mean, I think, you know, U of T at least has recognized since the time I started law school in 2009 and the last few years that every student needed more of an orientation to how to do law and it's not the same as what U of S was providing and hopefully will eventually provide and that Lori has been developing and that Lakehead and Robin have been developing. Um, but there is more of an orientation now, I think, at a lot of the law schools. And I also think, and I say this very carefully because it's always two steps forward and one step back, but the law schools are starting to recognize the value of the indigenous knowledge and the indigenous law knowledge that indigenous folks bring to the institutions. And there is a recognition of the value of that. Like we're going into communities, we're doing indigenous law camps, we're sitting with uh, John Boros and his community at Nawash, we're you know, going into these communities and like there's a little bit more of an awareness of the value of that education on the part of the institutions now. Um, so, you know, we recognize, uh, and certainly as Indigenous people working in these big colonial institutions, we recognize that, like, we're not recruiting you just because we want to, like, get our Native numbers up. We're recruiting you because you're going to make a huge impact to the community. Um, you're going to bring every part of you with you into the institution, and you're going to help us educate your professors. So it's reciprocal in that way slowly. Um, okay, so we have about five minutes left. I'm going to skip forward and, um, oh, there was one question about how many hours of studying per week. Anyone want to give a quick answer to that? I will just reiterate what, I was, I would just reiterate what Etienne said is to treat it like a full-time job. Like he went there, like you can do Monday to Friday, nine to five, um and go to your classes and study but it would probably be a bit more than that depending on your ability to uptake the the content and your ability to you know um connect with the classes like some classes you're not going to connect with and that that happens uh, so you're gonna have to do a bit hard like more work to be like how do i get interested and become passionate about contract law i i did not do that <laughs> like it was harder for me um, but I was very, but I connected with uh, criminal law and I did very well in that. So, and then I ended up practicing neither of those things, by the way. <laughs> like, um, but it, yeah, you just, it, it really depends on uh, your individual um, practices, but I would uh, like to begin with, like treating it like a full-time job um, is a good piece of advice from Etienne Schlega. Yeah, I agree completely. You're doing yourself a disservice if you're trying to split yourself between a whole bunch of different things. And I will use that as a segue to talk about the cost of law school, because um, one of our questions was about funding that's available. So I will start by acknowledging U of T is the most expensive law school in the country. 
And, um, and, you know, that is a challenge for me when I'm doing recruitment, but we also have one of the best, if not the best financial aid program for our students and our, uh, our dean who just finished his term in December um, did an outstanding job of fundraising for student financial aid generally, but specifically for Indigenous student financial aid, um, including a gift from uh, one couple, the Lovelands of over a million dollars for Indigenous student financial aid. And we've recently changed the, um, the financial aid policies so that Indigenous students are getting more support and more and not like not loans, the more bursaries for attending U of T law. So, um, and that's just one example. I, I, I know the other law schools have it, but in general, in terms of funding that's available, if you're band funded, obviously that's helpful to you. But if you're not band funded, Inspire is available. Um, the various law schools have their own funding pots for, um, for Indigenous law students at U of T. We have uh, Gladys Watson Award that is available. We have, um, other like centralized uh, bursaries that are available to students. And then depending on your community, you, you could have access to other pots of money. Does anyone want to say anything very general about money? No, the schools generally all have their own bursary systems. Um, for at Osgood generally, like we do have um, money specific for Indigenous students, but Indigenous students also access lots of bursaries and scholarships that are not specific to Indigenous students at all. Um, so uh, we recommend you apply for all of them. Uh, for bursaries, we do try to balance out, like if you have funding from your band and there are students who don't have funding from their band, uh, we try to balance that out so that both, both those students have access to the same kinds of support, financial support. Um, and I hope other schools do that too. Like, you know, if someone has full tuition paid from their band um, and also a monthly living allowance and then also gets all the extra funding and bursaries, I don't think that would be super fair. Um, but I, I hope that most schools are trying to balance out all of their Indigenous students and making sure they all get through without debt. And if they're ever in a position with it where they can't pay, figuring it out and and making and helping them and supporting them and making sure that they can pay and that they are not leaving law school because they can't pay. Yeah, and, and like the part time program that's like kind of a more school on like school to school thing that I think you can make specific inquiries. We have a financial aid calculator on our on U of T Law's website. So you can enter all of your numbers and get a pretty good idea of how much support you would get from the school. Um, uh, the next question. Well, maybe I'll, I'll leave as our last question a question that's very COVID specific, but I do think that it is will be interesting to see what happens in the future. So someone asked what percent of a law degree from an Ontario university can be completed remotely, which I think up until pre COVID, the answer would have been 0%. <laughs> and now uh, things have changed drastically. And um, I don't know, Robin, do, have you thought about this at all? Or Landon, I see you just unmuted. Yeah, there was, a I was just gonna say, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Robin. There was a question in the chat that I did respond to. You. I think it was Gary. Um, yeah, as, as Amanda said, before COVID, no, no online. During COVID, it's all online. After COVID, I don't know personally. I'm not sure how that's going to change. It'd be nice if the legal landscape changed along with uh, the times and there were more offerings, but I can't say how it's going to look at Lakehead personally, to be honest. Thanks, Robin. Uh, Landon, could... did you want to add something or Andrew? I was just, I was just going to say like, I know a couple people at Osgood who did like full semesters remote. They just listen to like lectures, but it's not recommended. And then they would just show up for their 100% finals. But again, not recommended. And that's allowed because Osgood records its lectures. U of T as a yeah, person, yeah doesn't. Andrew, Queens? So, yeah, I, I think that every situation is going to be a little bit different. I, I think that the intention, I mean, Queens was. We were kind of lucky in that we had uh, the undergraduate certificate in law. Uh, like Queens doesn't have an undergraduate program in justice studies or or criminology or anything like that. So the answer that we 
that the faculty took is they launched a certificate program that undergrads could take as electives, regardless of what what um, faculty they're a part of. Uh, so all of our faculty that taught in that program are, are used to the the you know teaching online or at least a hybrid approach. Uh, I think that the intention though is that for the law school, the JD studies. Um, at the first opportunity, it makes sense to go back to online or in-person classes. We're we're going to um, now. Each faculty member has their own ability to teach their classes how they want, and I think that some eyes is, have been opened on how to deliver courses. So I think that we will start to see a lot more hybrid approaches for uh, you, you know the coursework. But I don't think we'll ever be in a situation where we'll be able to live remotely and not be on campus during the school year, barring a pandemic situation kind of thing. So, um, but never say never. Uh, that's where we are right now is that we'll be back I, in person at the first opportunity. I have something also to correct about what Landon said. We at Osgood do not have online courses. And actually the Canadian Federation of Law Societies requires that uh, like, I, like something like 80% of your classes be in person so we do not recommend that you only listen to recorded lectures like we actually are required to attend classes at Osgood unless it's COVID and it's remote and it's like approved by your school um but yeah we don't we don't do online classes and we um it's like we are actually like you have to attend class like I said unless it's um, sanctioned by the school that you don't have to, uh, and or you talk about an accommodation with your specific school about whether you attend or not, accommodation being a medical or disability related or family status related accommodation. Yeah, I think that there's very few asynchronous courses, even when they're online, like they're in, they're taught live, they just happen to be online. So it's not, um, I think that most professors, from what I understand, have a problem with recording. They own the content in their courses and they don't want it recorded and released. So um, that's that's their bag. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, so I am gonna I'm gonna end it there, but I'm gonna invite everyone to send emails with further questions if they didn't um, if they didn't feel satisfactorily answered. Um, I hate to end Lori's family reunion that's happening in the chat right now because it's actually it's killing me. It's amazing. I had um, law school reunion. Grace, I went to law school with Grace Chagosh's mom. <laughs> amazing. Next gen. Next gen niche lawyers. That's so good. Um, okay, this has been so fun. It's been so nice to see your faces. I'm so grateful to everyone who stuck it out till the end. Um, you know, this is just the first of many conversations, hopefully, that we have with you about your future and your path to becoming a lawyer in Ontario or another province um, in the same way that we're not going to fight for you amongst ourselves. We also, if you want to go to a different law school in a different jurisdiction, then we're happy to answer questions about that and those opportunities. So um, all of our contact information is on the website where you registered. And we're going to follow up with emails and um, we will try not to spam you. But thank you so much uh, for being here. Miigwech, Marcy, and Yahweh. Um, good luck. And uh, I look forward to seeing your names in my admissions piles too. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Say good good job, Amanda. Um, I just kicked Chelsea out. Um, no, I thought that went really well. Excellent. Yeah, good job. Really good job. I think it went it went well. The all the panelists were so good. So good. Like, they were was, yeah. Too bad we didn't have more time. Yeah, it's like they went to law school or something. Care about <laughs> students. <laughs> Jamie is such a fucking hero. <laughs> like they were all amazing but like when Jamie was yeah. like let me tell you like a few things that I've done and then she's yeah. like <laughs> and I'm just like oh my god I feel so yeah yeah it was it was good <laughs> I really liked it and uh sorry if I uh, took over too much I don't know why I do that
Sorry. Oh, no, it was awesome. I'm so glad. Oh, I'm just going to stop the recording. Um, I'm so glad 